the, uh, the intention that I had today was to talk about how the digital representations that we build of humans in computers affect how human beings then proceed to treat each other. So um, there are a couple of different ways that I can give that talk. Uh, one of them is kind of abstract, theoretical, and political, and one of them is very practical and very businessy and very blockchain flavored. Uh, does anybody particularly care about blockchains? Is that a topic of strong interest? A couple of hands? Right, so you're going to get the abstract and political version of this because it doesn't matter. Um, I've spent basically three years inside of market capitalism plugging away at, uh, thank you, attempting to sound like a reasonable human being to business people after I abandoned ship on the political projects that I'd been part of. And uh, it does impose a certain cognitive burden going back into the world of theory. So if this is a little creaky in places and sounds a little flim flammy, you know, the next two talks I'm doing in the next two countries are very grey suit events. Um, so, uh, if we go back to the beginning of computers representing human beings, human beings started as integers, right? The IBM Holworth punch card systems that you go back to basically had a unique ID number for every human being, and it was simply an index number. And the sum totality of your hum humanity as it was represented to the computer was just a number. You were literally a number, you weren't a name. Uh, if you were a name, you were a name really for tax purposes and not really much else. And that sort of an approach is very typical, right? If you think about your relationship with dysfunctional organizations, to dis for dysfunctional organizations, you always feel like you are simply a number in a machine, right? There's no sense that you're being treated as an individual, you have very little humanity, you're just a number. Now, that is at one end of a spectrum of dialogue, right? At one end, you are completely dehumanized into a number. At the other end, you have pervasive wraparound surveillance capitalism that knows everything you ever did and is capable of doing things like predicting that people are pregnant before their parents know. So the rich representation of a human being is not necessarily for the human being's benefit. Rich representations of human beings can be against our interests or for our interests. So your friends have a, rep a rich representation of who you are, and that rich representation represents a balancing of their interests and your interests in an ongoing sustainable dynamic relationship. But the rich representation that's held about you inside of, say, Amazon or Facebook is largely for the benefit of serving you advertising. And here we get to an interesting juncture, which is we sort of assume that advertising is instinctively a bad thing. But in theory, the perfect advert is as valuable to you as direct human communication from somebody that knows you intimately. Right? We all have a set of unfilled needs which are theoretically fixable with a product. Right? I persistently need different kinds of weird bits of AV and equipment. I want a cable that does this. And if somebody advertised to me, hey, Vinay, that cable that you wanted, we have one for you now, this would be extremely useful communication. There'd be no loss of quality of life in my experience for being shown something that I actually wanted and needed and could afford. The problem that we have here is twofold. Firstly, most of the advertising is for terrible things that we don't want because the model is not rich enough to get rid of all the advertising which is not relevant to our interests. Right? Every time I log on to any kind of social media platform right now, all I see is adverts for blockchain startups trying to sell me their bloody tokens. Right? And all I'm seeing is the entire world is just a wraparound of token advertising. Oh my god, these idiots. Right? At, at the same time, <coughs> uh, there is also the secondary agenda, which is the company that's serving me the ads is not particularly interested in my welfare. So it's not going to serve me ads for things which are preferentially good for me. It doesn't care whether the advertiser is advertising things which are bad for me or good for me. Would you like to buy this product which does not really exist and will steal your money? They don't care. So it is not the wraparound nature of the advertising experience that causes us the problem. What causes us the problem is that the ads are irrelevant and predatory. And the stuff which is irrelevant is simply predatory on attention. Right? It's that problem of insufficient representation uh, turning into a cognitive predatory ecosystem that takes us into an environment where advertising is essentially parasitic rather than symbiotic. 
and we can all kind of notion that the perfect uh, model of yourself that has the ability to accurately, for example, find the things you're interested in in the media or report to you when a piece of software that you care about is updated could theoretically also bring you intelligence about products which have been created or offers of things you might want to do like vacations with your friends. So I want to stress very clearly that the problem here is not having rich representations of human beings and machines filtering information for their benefit. The problem is the agency of the rich model. If the rich model is owned by advertisers and the advertisers make more money by being parasitic and idiotic rather than being sophisticated and helpful, you're going to wind up in a position where you wind up just nailed to the mast by the big databases because the business model in which your personal data is embedded is inherently bad for you. But it's not hard to imagine similarly rich representations that existed in your service rather than as predation upon you. So it is not the richness of the model that represents the inherent problem, it's the agency of the model. And this gets directly into a set of questions about the long-term future of AI, uh, where we start questioning whether or not an AI is uh, working on your behalf or on behalf of its owners and operators, and the questions of how we even find correct language to discuss agency in artificial intelligence is the topic of another talk, which I'm still in the process of figuring out the underlying structures for. Um, but that question about agency of other people's software, I think, is an extremely deep philosophical question. And it also connects very nicely to computer security uh, in the form of a thing called the capability-based operating system. So capability-based operating systems provided an extremely high level of computer security because they assumed that all code had the agency of its creator, unlike the Unix model or the Windows model or the Mac model, where all code has the agency of the person running the program. So when we assume that the code has the agency of the creator plus the agency of entropy, because all code contains bugs and bugs are essentially entropic, then you wind up building a computer system which doesn't trust the, the user's uh, decision to run the code as overriding the interests of the author of the code. It preserves the model of agency right the way through the computer security system that they built. And these systems are theoretically at least extremely secure. They've never been fully effectively commercialized, uh, largely because there is a general sense that it's a little bit too complicated. But I think in the long run, it's the only way we're likely to find secure computers. You have to model the agency of the artifacts correctly to be able to produce genuine security. So I'm going to go back to this question of rich representation. So probably at this point, the richest behavioral representation that we have lives inside of the advertising world. And the advertising world backdoors directly into the national security apparatus. To all intents and purposes, the NSA is Google, is Facebook, is Twitter, uh, is your internet service provider. All of that information is being scraped and pooled. And the internet is essentially a single giant eye from the perspective of the NSA. I would be entirely unsurprised if they weren't using the entire internet as training data for an artificial general intelligence. Because as we've seen, the person with the most data generally does the best job inside of AI. When you multiply the amount of data by a factor of a couple hundred thousand times, the efficiency of almost any AI algorithm goes straight up. And the possibility here is that the reason that they're so data hungry is that it's a training set for an intelligent machine. Um, and you can see the train of logic which would lead there. The intelligent machine is required to parse the data. The machine gets more intelligent the more data you give it to parse. There's a positive feedback loop there that could very well be the thing that first bootstraps artificial general intelligence. And that's not a reassuring thought, right? If you think you're worried about Google's AI, how much more worried should we be about the uh, NSA's AI? Because for one thing, if they crack that problem, we're not going to hear about it for decades. Right? The Enigma machines that were used to win World War II were not revealed as having been broken until, what, what year? Late 50s, early 60s? You know, carefully kept secrets. So representation one, the behavioral database maintained by the state and its proxies in the form of the large corporations, the unification of state and corporate power. Um, rich data set two, uh, all of these attempts which were made to take the body into the virtual. So you start with virtual reality, and initially you are simply a disembodied point. If you put on a headset like you would get around a phone, uh, what do they call it, Google's, I can't remember what it's called now, anyway, whatever it is, the simple goggles into which you slot a phone. Um, you look around that world, 
as a disembodied point whose location is entirely virtual. So you're in the system. If you move your head up and down, the system doesn't know you've moved your head up and down. It does know if you rotate. So it's got no absolute positioning. If you step forward or you step back, nothing changes. So your absolute positioning is invisible to the system. It doesn't exist. Your rotational positioning, as you turn your head, the system can pick up because it has gyroscopes, right? accelerometers. So you're a point with pitch, yaw, and roll. X, Y, Z, that's all you are. You're represented by a quaternion. Um, so there's nothing of you in the system because all the system has is an abstract godlike point. And that's all the, the, all the information that the VR system has of you. There's nothing else there. We go up one more step of technology into something like the Vive. The Vive has a couple of external positioning points. It has masts on which there are IR beacons which uh, basically scan a laser across the scene to identify where things are. So at that point, we now have the spatial positioning, right? The X and the Y and the Z are represented, not just the pitch and the yaw and the roll. And uh, once you have that spatial positioning, we begin to see more of you. The system knows how tall you are because it can see your head, right? That's not a bad piece of progress, okay? Now if I move up and down, the system knows I move up and down. You can do kind of look around like this. And that ability to know just those three additional pieces of information immediately builds a different kind of a bridge. Because now you're no longer just the abstract point of perception, you're the abstract point of perception that is directly moved by the body in a completely um, different way to just the rotation of the head. And why it seems so different is quite tricky. Because in Western cultures we're taught to very much identify with the brain as the seat of self, we generally feel like if we're moving our head around, we're moving our mind around. The pitch and the yaw and the roll, in some sense, is a mental construct. Once you start to be able to move the body around, we begin to think of the body as being this robot to which we are attached, and now the VR system is beginning to build an interface with the robot. Now, all of these things are cultural constructs. If you'd gone to the Middle Ages, they would have told you the seat of the self was your liver or your heart or some other thing. Right? But the fact that we're beginning to bring the body into the system inside of the constructs that we're in changes our perception of what the machine is doing. Now there is a little piece of the body in the system and we can do things with our nominated body that go beyond our head. And that's the beginnings of bringing some of the self into the system. The weird thing is, when you then look for the body, there's no standard representation of the body. So sometimes you look down and there's nobody there. There's just a floating point, and you can't see yourself at all. Sometimes there's an abstract body. So there are games where there's simply a torso which looks like a medieval suit of armor. No arms, no legs. There's just a torso and a helmet. You look like a ghost. Oh, well, I guess I'm a ghost. What's holding this armor up then? Right? But it's a little bit of a representation of the body. In other games, there is a body, but the body isn't your body. So you look down and you're aware that your foot is forward and the system just has a leg that goes straight to the ground. And this is very disturbing. Like, oh, that's not right. What's that doing there? So that initial attempt to represent the body goes into a space where it's semantically incoherent. We have no semantics of the body inside a virtual space using the existing technologies. You can do it. You can walk around and you, you can look at things and all the rest of that stuff. As long as you don't ask who or what you are, it's relatively compelling. As soon as you ask that question, falls to pieces. Right? So this is a second model of the body. Right? First model of the self, you've got the big data set. Second model of the self, you just have the disembodied point. Third model, you begin to have the disembodied point plus some relationship with the actual machinery. Uh, you can go further. You could put hands into the systems. You t hold two controllers, the controllers show you hands, the hands have even worse problems with representation. You look at the hand, and the hand is not in the position of the hand that is holding the controller. You push a button to make the hand open and close to pick objects up, but you physically know that your hand is holding the controller. And if you make the mistake of opening your hand because you want to open your hand at the game, the controller falls out of your hand. Now, okay, it's on a little strap, but that constant mismatch between 
the actual mechanics of the body and the positioning of the instruments with the representation of the self inside of the forms uh, causes a kind of dissonance around the body. And that dissonance around the body hasn't shown up in a big way as a problem in VR because most of the people that are using VR systems are nerds and find dissonance around the body perfectly normative. Oh, look, there's dissonance around the body, just like always. Ah, right. Um, you know, that thing where you can just teleport around by pushing the button and you can kind of go bing, 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 bing around the scene. You know, that feels much more natural to me sometimes than trying to get in things like taxis. It's always a different shape. Why are the seats never in the same place? What are these doors? Right? So that kind of uh, approach where the world is not right already and it continues to be not right in VR will work fine for nerds. Right? The problem will be when you get to the general public who are generally speaking much more embedded in their physicality that they will come into these things and they will feel terrible because if you're somebody that spends half an hour a day looking in a mirror, it becomes really, really, really difficult if you're in an environment where you see yourself and you're not you. Right? Do you see how direct this is? And you know, half an hour a day looking at yourself in a mirror is pretty normal for people that are not nerds. I mean, more women than men, but you know, people spend a lot of time on this stuff. Right? For them, it appears to be very important. They put a lot of effort into it. I mean, have you heard of this thing they have called fashion? Right? I, I didn't really understand it at all, but when I started having to interact with people in a business context, th you have to like dress in particular ways to get access to particular kinds of micro societies. It's absolutely bonkers. Can you not just set the bit with CH, you know, CH mod? No, no, it turns out in the real world that there are sets of protocols that involve the use of physical tokens for access to social spaces. It's absolutely bizarre. So, you know, this is what happens when you leave academia. You have to go and learn this stuff from scratch. There ought to be a guidebook. Um, so the representation of the body as an issue that divides the nerds from the non-nerds, I think, is going to be acutely felt inside virtual reality. Right? Until we solve the body representation problem, it's going to be an absolute dog. Now, then we get to the question of, well, what happens when we solve the body representation problem? So... How do we do it? We put a bunch of, let's say, LiDAR machinery into the room so we can tell exactly how far away all of our pixels are. We scan the physical bodies using more LiDAR. We do all kinds of clever things involving bringing in a pre-existing digital model of your physical body and putting it inside of the virtual world. And at this point, things begin to get weird. Uh, I did a kind of accidental experiment of this in Second Life must have been more than 10 years ago. Second Life, you know, simple uh, alternate reality system, big virtual space. You had a kind of avatar constructor where you could build a little model of yourself and take it in. And the standard human representation that most people picked was a kind of seven foot high elf or a dragon or a demon or, you know, some kind of substantially altered human form. And I, being kind of naive about this, just made a virtual person that looked as much like me in the real world as possible. So it was this kind of, you know, bald guy, beige, yellow shirt, green striped pants, and I was just kind of wandering around in this thing looking like myself. In that environment, this turned out to be obscene, right? People would be like, why does your avatar look like that? I'm like, this is what I look like in the real world. They're like, ah! Right? Because for them, this was breaking the sense that they had, that they had detached their consciousness and put it somewhere else into a body that was better than the body they were already in, right? And that dynamic where for some percentage of the population, virtual spaces will appeal to them because they can conceive of peeling their mind out of their current physical body and putting it into a different thing versus for people who identify with the body as self and the idea that you can peel off the software and abstract it onto some other platform seems horrific, completely disorienting. These differences in how we model and represent the body and the mind turn out of direct consequences on adoption of technology. And I think that right now, if you look at the dialogue inside of transhumanism about skimming the algorithms off people and then re-implementing them in silico, for most people, they don't believe their algorithms. They, they have no notion that they could be represented in some sense as a bunch of weights on size of a very, very, very large graph. Right? And whether you believe that or not, changes how you relate to the kind of, you know, we're going to upload our personalities kind of dreams. 
Right? For some people, that stuff seems reasonable and intuitive. You could just skim off the algorithms, put the software on much better hardware. For other people, it seems kind of horrific. Like, I'm not an algorithm, I'm a person. Well, what defines you? Well, is it this, you know, 70 kilograms of meat? Or, or, or you, you see, right? And we don't have objective scientific answers to most of these questions. Until somebody actually succeeds in uploading a consciousness, we're not really going to know whether consciousnesses are algorithms or whether they are some kind of weird kind of phenomena that we haven't gotten a handle on. You know, maybe it's the Penrose model when it's all quantum mechanical. Maybe it's something which is uh, buried at a much lower level of understanding. We don't know whether algorithms map to consciousness any more than hydraulics map to consciousness because they used to think it was all hydraulic. Is the algorithm an actual fit for the nature of mind? Or is it an enormously crude approximation that covers almost none of the actual functions in mind? And the short answer is we don't know. Every civilization goes through a period of assuming that the highest scientific thing they have access to accurately reflects the nature of consciousness. It's a very repetitive cycle. Now, um, with all that framed, uh, let me try and make a bit of a scramble to the high ground. So, what I'm going to suggest is that every computer system has inside of it an abstract representation of what a human being is. Right. Uh, the surveillance marketing system <coughs> thinks that you're a set of preferences and it uses your observed behaviors in what you click to model your preferences. And these preferences have predictive value that can be exploited. The virtual reality system that we discussed in theory, which scans in the entire body so you can take your body with you into VR, that system is uh, designed to produce fun. Right? You take your body with you into a place which you couldn't ever exist in, like you're wandering around inside of a lava dome, and you're having fun. The product is fun. Right? Uh, the model of the self is literally the surface of the skin is the you that you're taking in. Um, we go to systems like computer security systems. When you log into a system, you're a username, you're a password, you're a set of permissions, and you're some files. And that's the Unix model of a user. That's what a user is, right? It's a model of a human. For our purposes, the relevant model of the human is this. The uh, IBM Holrith machines, which were so popular in Germany before World War II, the user was a number, right? It was a number, it was a name, it was a genealogy. Right? So inside of all these schemas, inside of these data structures, is embedded a philosophical position on a human. And it's never made explicit. How does this system perceive the human being that is using it is not a question that we ask in software. And this is not, by the way, from a kind of critical theory perspective. Although this is sort of a critical theory question, I'm actually looking at this from a very pragmatic engineering perspective. Because the user can't get anything out of the system that the system doesn't represent. If there's no model of the thing inside of the system, I as a user don't exist in that dimension of my being. So a good example of this is search history. Right? Systems download search history. Right? They, they keep it, they sync it, they do all this kind of stuff. But the systems don't, generally speaking, store the full text of everything I've seen. So I remember seeing something, but unless I happen to remember the title, which will be recorded in the search history, I can't retrieve the text. So my memory of the situation is larger than my computer's memory of the situation, and this is absurd. Right? It constantly feels wrong that I can't do a full text search for everything that I've seen on the internet on any of my computers. But for whatever reason, they don't by default store that, even though there are, you know, half a terabyte of free hard drive on the desktop, um, we just, it's just not tracking what I, what I did. So my recollection of the situation exceeds that of my machine, because the machine is only storing the history in terms of a headline and a URL, and I'm storing the history in terms of this complex neural mass of interconnected bits. So the fact that history is thrown away is a decision that somebody made, because they weren't trying to model my memory and enhance my memory, they were only modeling my behavior. And in this respect, the browser manufacturers had gotten a little bit contaminated with the advertising model. The fact that it doesn't have the full text history is because they didn't think about me as a user looking at information or recording bits of it. They only thought about a click history. And I don't want a click history, I want a memory model. And that sort of disjoint function is everywhere inside of software. 
right? Because we don't explicitly state what is the user to us and how does the user interact with our technology, we're not really starting in a way which is genuinely user-centric. Now, why do we want to be user-centric? Because we want good tools, right? Cognitive ergonomics will define the future of the human race. There is no doubt in my mind at all that if we do not successfully figure out how to build tools that fit our intelligences as smoothly as the tools that we made for, say, woodworking fit in our hands, we're going to wind up with suboptimal human performance from now until the horizon. Uh, an example of this, which has been frankly disastrous for humanity on a pretty large scale, is, oh, look at that, how perfect, the QWERTY keyboard, right? Designed as much as possible so that when you typed letters, uh, each letter would be typed with the other hand, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, and designed to slow you down enough that the keys wouldn't jam, so it put a lot of frequently used letters on inconvenient and weak fingers. Uh, for example, the letter A is on your pinky, which is not a very strong finger, and the letter G, which is far less used, is on the strong index finger. So that sort of decision-making was designed to make mechanical typewriters that wouldn't jam. And we've lived with a 30% less speed in inputting text into computers for, what is it, 100 years? 150 years? When was QWERTY invented? It's ancient. We got locked onto a standard that turns out to be terrible for human beings, and it produces a whole bunch of crippling injuries from things like RSI, because the little fingers are just not made for the kind of load that you put on them if you type a great deal. And we probably all know people that have had career at risking injuries from repetitive strain, and a lot of those injuries are resolved for people when they move onto a keyboard design that's designed for human hands. Right. So we've got untold people, hundreds, thousands of people who had career ending injuries because we designed a keyboard around the needs of a machine rather than the needs of a person, and then we standardized on it. This is incredible. Right? Now imagine what that looks like if we take it into the domain of uh, software design. What does it do to your mind to have a situation in which your computer uh, stores less of what you've read than you do? Right Now I have to try and think, what I have to search for? Oh, I have to go back to Google, and I have to try and remember enough of what I read to type it into Google, and oh, that's interesting. I have to keep going back to the centralized search engine every time I want to try and remember something because my local machine won't remember it for me. Do you hear what I'm saying? Right? The natural cognitive model is that my computer should store what I've read and I should be able to see it. Instead, we have a position where every time we want to recall something that we saw and we can't remember exactly where it is, we have to go back to a single global server to go and retrieve that information. The model of the software in front of me has been deformed by the imperative that I should continue returning to a search engine, perhaps. Maybe that's how this works. I'm not sure. But the cognitive ergonomics of the situation are suboptimal because rather than being able to look for only what I have seen, which means if it's in my memory, I know it's in my machine, I'm now going back to the general pool where I'm subjected to all the other things which sort of kind of sound like that out of the entire global pool of all possible objects. And that modeling right, of the relationship between me and my computer as an extension of my humanity is not done because the computer is not understood as an extension of my humanity, it's understood as a product. Right? Now, does this all sort of make sense so far? I'll take one or two questions here just to make sure we're all on track, because the next bit is where it begins to get strange. Any, any immediate points of clarification? We're all good for the next tier? Right. Let us go into the great sea. Now, um, as we move forward, we're in a position where all of our natural resources are extremely constrained, and we have 7.5 billion people heading for 9 billion. So in this kind of a future, there is a need for accurately modeling what is happening because we no longer have enough natural resources that we can kind of wing it. Right? When you've got a couple of hundred thousand human beings as the total global population, it really doesn't matter what they do because they're not affecting very much. When you've got seven and a half billion human beings who, with the human beings, 
plus their animals like dogs and particularly cows and sheep and things like that, represent something like 90 or 95% of all vertebrate biomass. Literally, if you weigh everything which has a spine by the kilo, something like 90% of it is us and our pets, right? In that kind of environment, how we behave suddenly has dramatic consequences because there are so many of us that the amplification of those behaviors sloshes around the entire global ecosystem as if there's no tomorrow, which frankly, given our current ways of behaving, there may not be. So when we get into this question of modeling a human being inside of a computer, in all probability, the way that we are going to manage natural resources in future to ensure that we don't drive ourselves into extinction or accidentally, I don't know, uh, eat the remaining elephant will be driven by a computer model of a human being, right? There will be a piece of software in the future which figures out you and what you are consuming and what you are uh, throwing away, right? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What is the processing? Uh, how much meat are you eating? How much carbon dioxide are you emitting from your energy streams? Uh, what percentage of the world's global supply of brass are you currently holding on to, right? How much is the stainless steel in your possession currently worth? And is anybody willing to buy the stainless steel that you currently own off you because it's more valuable inside of a jet engine than it is inside of the cutlery drawer where you haven't used it in 20 years, right? And that need to build an adequate representation of the assets of the human race so that we can efficiently allocate them applies whether we are talking about this stuff inside of a market structure, whether we're talking about it inside of some kind of uh, a managed economy or planned economy, or whether we're talking about some kind of you know, post-human machine economy where we basically ride on the back of artificially intelligent, intelligent infrastructure like pets. Right? It doesn't really matter. There are too many of us for us to just slosh around without having any kind of optimizable data layer that will allow us to manage environmental impact. And this is the agenda behind smart city. Smart city is entirely about figuring out what people are using so that you can change how much of it they're using at the points where it's expensive to provide for their needs. And the, there's a simple economic argument for this. If your peak consumption requires 100 power stations to meet, but you're only at peak consumption two days a year, right? the rest of the year, power station number 100 is asleep. You only use it two days a year, and the rest of the time it's just sitting there not doing anything. So you're paying for a power station for 365 days, but you're only using it for two, and therefore the energy from that power station is very expensive. Right? And if you could just reduce the peak a little, you can make it work with 99 power stations rather than 100. So you can ask people, hey, the power grid is really, really busy right now. Could you please not run the washing machine? You could ask people whether they would mind not running their dishwasher for two hours. Right? And that kind of stuff can save your society billions and billions and billions of dollars. This is why they're pushing for smart grid. But if that stuff is going to be genuinely efficient, it's going to need a model of the human being and the human being's activities so that it can figure out where it can shave grid load without directly impacting your quality of life. And if it's good enough at doing that, it can invisibly optimize the power utilization that we have as a society in a way that leaves you with a more effective, more efficient society and no reduction in quality of life. Now, for us in ridiculously affluent societies and in ridiculously affluent corners of ridiculously affluent societies, the need for that kind of extreme brute force optimization is not particularly clear. But if you have this discussion inside of a country like India or Mexico, where brownouts because the electrical grid doesn't have capacity or a regular fact of life, the idea that you could add a data layer to the electrical consumption and stop the brownouts is a real thing. Because in a lot of societies, we have direct choices to make between different uh, courses of action which all affect people's quality of life. Um, the old saying about this was guns or butter. Uh, I can't remember which president it was, I think it was Roosevelt, possibly Eisenhower. They used to say that you know, every bullet fired uh, is you know, a direct uh, reduction in the shelter and housing and clothing available to all the pe people who were poor inside of America. That there was a direct choice for every economic action, was it producing welfare or warfare? And 
that sort of modeling, if you think of us as a single polity, as a single planet's worth of humans, that's incredibly important. Right? Because we don't have the data layers, we're throwing away huge amounts of room for optimization. And if we get that optimization right, people will live when otherwise they would starve. Right? Think of the food supply chain. How much of the stuff which is in the food supply chain is winding up as junk rather than feeding somebody that would gladly eat it? Mm, right? Not comfortable. A lot of problems. So, given that unless we find some kind of enormously abundant global economy, and I mean so much stuff that we don't even count it, profligate waste in the same way that we don't really care about storing a half gigabyte file anymore, I don't know, just throw it somewhere, right? Unless we see that kind of exponential acceleration in resource availability for all physical things to the point where everything is as cheap and as abundant as bits are, unless that happens, we're going to wind up using computers to moderate our resource use. And if we go down that track, the model of a human being, which is embedded inside of those computers, is going to dramatically shape the entire future of the human race. How much natural resource is it appropriate for a human being to spend on art? At what point is your art habit over consumption of a kind that lowers the quality of life for somebody else? If some technocrat sets the value of art to 0.1% the value of sport, because sport is keeping people out of hospital and art is only making them more confusing, then you might be in a position where you just wind up optimizing the art out of your societies. Right? Now, I don't know, there's a lot of bad art out there. Maybe we should just optimize all of that out. Right? But that question of what do we optimize becomes a critical question when we're starting trying to figure out how are we going to run the world. And what are we going to optimize and how are we going to optimize it is going to be based on models of a human being because we're constantly attempting to reduce the impact on the actual human beings from the optimization that we're conducting. The optimization function is limited by the amount of optimization the human beings take before they will break the optimizer. Now, can anybody tell me what is the optimizer that we're currently running on the global economy and what is its model of a human being? It's a simple one word answer. What is the optimizer that we're using on the entire human race right now? Market, correct, right? And to the market, a human being is money. A human being is uh, an integer. It's a number of pence that you control. Right? It may be associated with a slightly richer model in terms of a list of the property you own if you own things like houses, but to all intents and purposes inside of the market economy, human beings are optimized by a single number, money. Alongside of this, there then goes a richer representation which your government stores, which may include things like health records, tax records, educational attainment. But very few of those things are visible inside of the market economy except at points like wage negotiation, where you take your educational certification and you convert it into more money. So this is the optimization function that we are currently using to run the universal. Now, could we design a richer representation of a human being which would allow us to perform more effective optimization of the global economy than money. Hmm. Hmm. That sounds like a pretty interesting research project. Could we design a better representation of a person than money and use that representation to optimize more efficiently than the current global economy optimizes? Now, I think the answer to that question is probably yes, right? In that it would be pretty hard to design a worse optimization than a many thousand year old system that hasn't undergone substantial updates in centuries, right? I mean, this, this money thing is incredibly out of date. Our informational bandwidth has increased probably a trillion times, literally a trillion times since it was invented. So why are we still using money as a way of making decisions in the situation where we've got damn near infinite data processing power. It just doesn't make any sense. If we optimize things down to a price, we've thrown away, what, everything but one ten thousandth of the information embodied in the object, and then we slide it across, and then the other person has to reconstruct it on the other end. You know, if you look at objects like, I mean, you know, take this cup, right? 
there isn't even an ID number on this thing. So if I want another one of these, how do I find another one of these? Right, okay, there's a pile of them up there, but if I was attached to this particular model of this particular object, there is no ID number for me to find another one. We've thrown away all of the data. Right, this, this incredibly nice little you know, timer thing that I use so I don't talk too long, well, three and a half minutes left. No ID number, no model number. If I want another one, there's no way to identify it. Okay? Probably 20% of the utility that Amazon has for me is that I can search for objects that I already own and identify exactly what they are in a way that I can transmit to another person if they want one. Right, Vinay, that screwdriver, where did you get that? It came from Amazon, here's a URL. Just attaching a URL to objects is a huge step forward in my ability to optimize other people's quality of life and for them to optimize mine because getting your objects right is the tooling that you use to interface to the world. So I think it'd be worth thinking about how we could build really decent models of what human beings are like that could be used to build much more optimal mediums for representing human welfare. Now, what kinds of things am I talking about here? Um, a simple example, right? If I have a data set that says where everybody lives, where everybody works, and what real estate is available, I have the ability to get you a house which is much closer to where you live. And data that I've seen suggests that divorce rates rise very, very rapidly for every minute over 45 minutes a day spent commuting. Actually, it might be 45 minutes each way, right? But there is a certain threshold at which the time pressure imposed by commuting is provably bad for human relationships. So the idea that you could take people whose marriages are in trouble and you could preferentially relocate them to housing which optimize their commutes and that this might save marriages with corresponding social benefit for all, you could really do that. Right? Cultures of 50, 60% divorce rates. Divorce seems to make people pretty miserable in most cases. The idea that it's simply a logistical problem that impacts people's ability to maintain relationships because of time pressure, it's an economic problem. Right? But we need a model of a human being that said commute time is bad for emotional relationships. Commute time is bad for your kid's educational attainment. Right? We need a model of a human being which included the full complexity of the actual reality of human experience. Even worse, we need a model which reflected the individuality of your human experience, because if you're one of the 1% of the population that appears to be asexual, then to all intents and purposes, the commute time thing probably doesn't matter as much than if you've got four kids and a wobbly marriage, right? We can only optimize what we can model. And if we mis-optimize because we misunderstand the individual involved, we're going to wind up with systems which have pathologies. Now, I don't think we're going to see systems that have pathologies worse than money in a hurry, but we are going to see systems which are brought in which have pathologies. Now. Uh, I am practically out of time, so I'm going to make two more points and then I'm going to read you something very brief because it's amazing. So, uh, point number one, cognitive ergonomics last for centuries. The predominant method that we use for thinking is language or occasionally mathematics and abstractions in language and mathematics have multi-century lifespans. Uh, the notation that we use for calculus came from uh, Leibniz, if I remember correctly, and we're still using it 700 years after calculus is invented. We still call it calculus. Uh, language structures like grammar go from language to language to language over uncountable millennia. Right? You know, linguists will tell you all about that stuff. So when we start talking about cognitive ergonomics, we're talking about stuff that has extremely long lifespans. And right now, we're not really thinking as if we're designing abstractions for the future. So when we start thinking about the very, very, very long-term future of the human race, getting our cognitive ergonomics correct is a huge part of that. Um, the other thing, very, very briefly, is I think it's incredibly important that we do this work open source. Because if we wind up where the best available models of human beings are proprietary and locked inside of other people's algorithm shops, we're going to have very real problems extracting that stuff and making it generally available later on because it will be tied up in things like copyright and patent. And if the things which are the uh, ontological foundations of the software which helps optimize the world for us turn out to be wrapped up inside proprietary software, ooh, we don't want to be part of that future. Um, so 
on that, I'm going to read you one little thing. Oh, I forgot to mention blockchains. Uh, one more sentence. So, the blockchain is an opportunity for this large-scale renegotiation because the blockchains, as they currently stand, have no semantics. So the semantics which are developed and imposed upon the blockchain will turn out to be the fundamental semantics which are used for interconnected global trade, possibly for centuries. So we've got an opportunity, because we have this new round of interconnectedness on computers, to make sure that the blockchains have a set of semantics which adequately represent humanity's needs, and for that matter, the needs of nature. Uh, and I'm very active in the blockchain space, largely to try and get a lot of these values into play in such a way that we get the best out of that technology rather than the worst, hence a company. So, a little bit from a book. Uh, this is, believe it or not, an epic poem, which is a very, very old literary form, arguably the oldest literary form we have, and it's an epic science fiction poem. One of Noah Blazo's friends, you've heard her, was Annalisa Grotius, who framed the eyeball maker's bill of rights, whereby the maze of intellectual property was solved by data mining in the web, entangled by a 3D point of view. She turned the problem upside down and blockchain from the user to the source made information a utility, fair valued by the user's use of it, paying surprise creators their reward. The point of this is showing that she was, like many of the giants we'll be meeting, a polymath whose curiosity, unlimited by modesty or pride, carried ideas over from one field like spores into another somewhere else, because, you might not know, her actual job was as a curator of Renaissance art in Amsterdam's once famous Rijksmuseum. Right. I haven't seen anybody bridge the gap between the epic form and science and technology before. I've never seen anything like it. The book is called Apocalypse, by a guy called Frederick Turner. And that's the kind of historical scope against which our technological struggles are really being played out. Right? If we get this stuff right, we get to be an interstellar species, and five million years from now, something that we can't even imagine evolving into will wonder what of its ancestors made the jump into space. And that's happening right here and right now. We are either those ancestors, or we're the people that dropped the ball and life stopped. So these questions about representation are the questions about the operating systems that we'll use to go into the stars, or that will fail us and we will not succeed in making the jump. So, you know, it's all to play for right here and right now, and we need the epic grasp of history to guide our actions because we are in epic times. The position that we're in is on the very forefront of the biggest thing that any living species has ever done, and we're screwing it up because the operating systems we're using to run our planet are terrible. Thank you. Right, done. Uh, I don't know if there's time for questions. I think there's another speaker right along. Cryptocurrency is universal banking. Oh, I don't know. I guess we're running late. We're pretty much on um, uh, I didn't realize there was time for questions. Yes. A friend of mine is doing. A friend of mine is doing. Um, is a is a boss of um, mobile repair, and he and he says that uh, from a the green perspective that the um, state of repairmanship of um, electronics is not very well optimized do you know uh, any w a way with which which when we can enhance that aspect of uh, consumption whereas yeah yeah um i did a bit of thinking about this a few years ago um the problem is that uh, we have zero defect manufacturing so because we can make things essentially perfectly, we put lots and lots and lots of components into our devices packed incredibly closely together. 
And in the one in a hundred thousand chance that one of those components stops working, they're basically impossible to pick off. So I think with the current generation of manufacturing technology, it's unlikely that things are going to become more repairable, and we probably need to focus more on recyclability. Uh, it's possible that you could have specific kinds of systems that were designed for repair, and I'm thinking of systems of large components like um, amplifiers, you know, capacitors, this kind of thing. But outside of the systems that have those kind of power handling components, I think repairability is likely to remain very low, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, it's kind of, I, I really, I used to look at the repair thing like this is a serious problem. And then I really looked at the manufacturing and I just, I couldn't see any way back from ultra-reliable manufacturing. You get to kind of one defect in 100,000 and repairability just goes out the window. Um, thing, things used to be repairable because of rework. If it was screwed up in the factory, you would fix it in the factory. Now, if it's screwed up in the factory, you just throw it away because it's so much more expensive than just making another one. Okay. Uh, I just uh, wanted to make a remark that it's quite interesting that market decided that virtual reality is hard and is doing this new shortcut where getting augmented reality, which doesn't have to deal with representation of the human. Yes. We just, well, showing something which already exists and we don't care about what it is. Mm. Yeah, um, this is quite interesting. I started my career on virtual reality. The first thing I was ever paid for was reviewing a virtual reality system for a magazine. Uh, and I spent the 90s as a graphics engineer so that I could build VR systems when they arrived. Wow, has it been a long wait. Um, and even now, you know, I mean, we, we have a, an HTC Vive in the office and people don't use it very much, right? I mean, it's, it's clear that there is additional magic to be done before virtual reality is r right in a way that encourages us to use these fabulous tools. Uh, and I've got some, you know, kind of theories about what's wrong with it, but, you know, it, it basically boils down to we're not there yet and we're building the little bridges we can. Um, I, I think that when AR begins to be a little more widely deployed, we're going to discover that it opens up a bunch of incredible cans of worms. Um, think of the, the sheer weirdness of the behavior that we saw around Pokemon Go, right? Just the weirdness of it, not the rightness or the wrongness, just the weirdness of it. Imagine what happens when somebody wraps an AR layer around something like Tinder or Grindr, right? What is going to happen? I don't know, but you're going to see tons of people behaving in crazy ways because their actions are being guided by a bunch of invisible cues that nobody else can see. I don't know what that produces, but I bet it's going to be bizarre. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, AR, the shortcut. So uh, we don't really have that much time for questions. But Just a small thing. Yeah. Uh, most of your talk uh, was around uh, what I would call a Western understanding of uh, individuality and its importance in uh, you know, in the world. And uh, if you imagine a system that is built from, a, say, a Buddhist perspective, uh, then uh, all the individual properties of you are could be considered even to be a flaw that you have to, yeah, you know. <laughs> and um, I wonder, I just wanted to ask your opinion on uh, the thing, um, you know, collective intelligence, collective... Uh, participation in one uh, individual, you know, is this, could be a model for a computer system to aim at and what do you think about it in general, you know? Yeah, so this is a very, very excellent question that I wish I had about 20 minutes to answer. Um, so let me do the second part first. So uh, this is an excellent point, right? I did talk very much about the individual as the unit of self. But if you even look at things like extended family units or the kind of tribal communities that you see around open source software development, it's very clear that a huge part of the utility of computers is connecting people together. And if you built the representation of the community or the family first and then attach the individual to it, you would have something that looks a little bit like how we handle companies. So in the world that we're in, in many ways, the company is the first class actor and the employee is then attached to it as a property. And you could imagine doing the same thing around family or community or lineage or something like that. Uh, I don't know whether those systems would be more or less supportive of human individuality and human rights or not. Um, because it's not clear to me that we have any generalized understanding of the value that human beings place on each other. 
like in the Nordic world, family has become less and less important as welfare state improved. In other parts of the world, like India, the extended family is still fundamental, but is it really just an economic arrangement? Hard to know. Um, well, on the second thing, uh, I am Hindu clergy, so I spent years and years and years and years uh, inside of a very serious Hindu uh, religious outfit. Uh, and I would now think of myself as being to some degree post-Hindu, because when you start asking hard questions about the intersection between science and religion, you usually have to side with science. So, um, if you take a very sophisticated philosophical view, it is much, much easier to model what's going on. Right? I mean, if you build computer systems from bad assumptions like dualism, you get software which is incredibly hard to write. If you go into a very, very serious, you know, profound philosophical understanding of the nature of the universe and then write that down as code, you wind up with systems like Lisp or Haskell. Now, these things are not fundamentally philosophical representations, but there are systems of abstraction which are mathematically grounded, which is the closest thing we're going to get to a kind of religion you can put inside of a computer. Right? If you want eternal truth, mathematics has it for you. So I think that it's important to think about this in terms of the difference between the languages which are functional and properly grounded, uh, or indeed any properly mathematically founded, uh, uh, any language of the proper mathematical foundation, versus the languages that we just kind of cobble together out of uh, things like procedural thinking. And that difference could equally well be applied to database design. You could have systems of representation for objects which have real mathematics uh, underlying their semantics, and they would be vastly more powerful and have much more utility than things which are basically uh, reifications of the kind of procedural knowledge that we use from day to day. But it's a great question. We should talk about that over lunch. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.